Good morning. I usually say to one half of the greatest group of people I know are in Michigan, but I, well, it filled out a little bit since the beginning. As we got started today, I thought everybody was going to be sick, but it looks like our crowd has improved. So good morning to everyone. This morning is the last Sunday of 2019, and as we dive into our lesson material, typically I would wait until the first Sunday of the new year to kind of share a message about direction and about focus for an all new year. And I'm not going to do that next week because Brother Tad Masteller, who I'm very excited for you to meet, is going to be here, and I'll be down in Mississippi preaching. And then the following week, we have, I'll be out of town, and Tom will be preaching because I need to preach the memorial service for Paul Methvin, who ran the Tahoe Family Encampment, and passed that over to me a couple years ago. So as we are moving towards this new year, I wanted to share our new year message today. And I really want to focus this morning on a word that's used all through the Old and New Testament. And it's a common word that we're familiar with, yet we perhaps don't always think about its definition because it's just so, so commonplace, so familiar to us. And that is the idea of what it means to be a neighbor. As we've been preparing to make our transition, we of course have a house to sell and, and so many different things to do. And we've had a few people come and look at our place and just the other day, someone was looking at the house and they asked a natural question. They said, what are your neighbors like? And I was so overjoyed to be able to give a glowing review of our neighbors. We have loved our neighbors. To the left of our house, we have a couple. They don't have any children at home, and they, keep them, they get the award in our subdivision every year for the best-kept yard. You know, they always have perfect. It makes us feel a little bad. That's the only part about it because we don't ever measure quite. Anybody have those folks in your neighborhood? It's just almost impossible, no matter how hard you work to live up to their standard. But that's who they are. But they are the finest folks. If you ever need to borrow anything, they are right there. They, there's many times that I would go out in the wintertime and think, oh, the driveway, because we do live in Michigan. And I don't have Bob's wife to, to you know, <laughs> shovel snow for me. I, I, his wife needs to talk to my wife a little bit, I'm thinking. But I don't have that, so I get out and think, I've got to snow blow or I've got to shovel that. But sometimes it's already done. Because my neighbor's gotten up early and he did his and he thought, I'll just do my neighbors on the left and my neighbors on the right and he'll just take care of it for everybody. Isn't that wonderful? But you know, when you think about that idea of neighbor, that concept is brought out all through the scriptures in so many different ways, but it's particularly important because you'll remember when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He gave two. He said, first of all, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And he says, the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And later on, when, a, when one of the Pharisees was asking him about this, he said, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus goes into what is probably the best known of all of his parables about the Good Samaritan. And so this idea of neighbor, what it means to be a neighbor, is more than just living next to somebody, isn't it? It's more than just being in close proximity. No, that concept is richer in Scripture than just that basic definition. You see, in Scripture, a neighbor is those all around us that we've been charged with treating in a godly way. It's those people in our lives, not just the people who live close to us. It's our friends. It's our coworkers. It's our associates. It's other people with whom we interact. And how we interact with those people is so crucial to the Christian message, the Christian life, that Jesus said that our treatment of them is the second greatest of everything we do. Second greatest commandment is how I treat other people. 
So as we talk about a neighbor this morning and think about 2020 moving ahead, as you move ahead and as Lenora and I will have our hearts with you as you continue to be the magnificent church that you are, I want to encourage you to continue to do what you've done for so long, which is to treat people like they're a real neighbor. Not just the way the world uses that word, but as the scripture uses that word. To really be a true neighbor. And we're going to focus in our text this morning in Leviticus chapter 19. Because you remember that when Jesus kind of frames all of the Christian life around love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself, those texts, those concepts are rooted not just in the New Testament. They're rooted way back in the old law. Because it's all one story. It's all one theme. It's all one message. And here in Leviticus chapter 19, Jesus What he tells us about being a neighbor is found, is connected back here to these rules that we often think of them as, to these concepts that are interwoven throughout the books of law, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And God will speak here through Moses and share in these four verses some powerful principles about what it really means, biblically, spiritually, to be a neighbor to treat people. And I think this is vitally important because the reason this church has had steady growth and a higher retention rate of people who come to the Lord than any church I have ever heard of in my entire life, not just known, even heard of in my entire life, I believe one of the crucial elements of why that's been the case year after year after year at Waterford, in addition to a fantastic leadership, in addition to good good ministers throughout the years and, and good youth ministers and great Bible class teachers and people with a servant heart, I think a crucial element of that is this church knows how to treat people. People who walk in from every walk of life You know how to treat people. We need to move forward and continue that spirit. Here, it starts in verse 13, Leviticus chapter 19. And he says, you shall not defraud your neighbor or rob him. The wages of him who is hired shall not remain with you all night until morning. Now, this is a little different concept than we all understand work. But the way that they're society in ancient times would function was different than it is today where we get a check at the end of a two-week period or a month period or we receive perhaps a direct deposit into our bank account. You're talking about a time when wages were either monetary but more often than not they were barter-based. You know, you may work and you may receive an animal or you may receive grain for that work. And because they didn't have banks to deposit and to transfer and move money, they would pay a worker at the end of his day's work. So in essence, you got paid for your day's labor. And notice what he's talking about here when he tells him, he says, you, when you have a worker, don't hold their wages until the morning. Now, if they held it till the morning, there's an implication there they'd still receive their wages. But he says, you go the extra mile to treat people right. You go the extra mile to be generous and to be kind. And so he tells us, first of all, a neighbor exemplifies goodness toward other people. In 1 Peter chapter 2, 15 through 17, Peter will echo this same sentiment. As he says, chapter 3, excuse me, chapter 2, 15 through 17. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. By doing good, you put to silence the ignorance of the foolish. As free, yet not using your liberty as a cloak for vice. What does that mean? Using liberty as a cloak for vice. I have heard that business all of my life, even in the church. Liberty, well, I'm free. I'm allowed to do something. 
How many times have people said, well, it doesn't say I can't. Or people say, you know, that's not technically wrong. If you have to use the word technically in a sentence to discuss what's right or wrong, then that already has told you what the right thing to do would be. Because Christians don't do what's technically right and don't do what's technically wrong. Christians do what's right. They go the extra mile. Put the extra effort in to treat people with exceeding goodness. Honor all people, he says in verse 17. Love the brotherhood. Fear God and honor the king. Honor all people. You see, in that time, it wasn't illegal for, a work, for an employer to hold back a worker's wages, but it was still immoral. God wants people, his people, to be different. Paul will say, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. We are to go beyond the letter of the law and excel in goodness towards other people. You see, the world would define a good person as a person who just doesn't do evil to others. But the story of the Good Samaritan, the, the two who passed him by, they didn't do anything wrong to him. But they weren't a true neighbor. A true neighbor is the one who goes the extra mile, who goes beyond the minimum standard and makes it his very mission to excel in goodness and fairness to other people. This church needs to continue in that great legacy of goodness to all of our neighbors. In the text, he continues back in Leviticus. In verse 14, he says, you shall not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shall fear your God, I am the Lord. Now these are interesting. Because he says, you shall not curse the deaf. Why not? They can't hear it anyway. Right? So what I see described here is a person who's laughing at the expense of someone, even though they never know it. He says, don't put a stumbling block in front of the blind. If the blind person comes and they trips over something, they'll never know it was you that did it because they couldn't see you do it. They'll never know. And so he's giving us a very important principle of what it means to really be a neighbor. Because he says here, a neighbor extends dignity to all mankind. We live in a world where people's dignity is being stripped away. Why would it matter if the deaf can't hear it? Why would it matter if the blind can't see it? Because it's about honor. It's about dignity. It's, a being a, it's about being a certain kind of person towards other people, regardless of whether they know it or not. This describes a person who cares not only for other people's well-being, but even cares about other people's feelings, about their emotions, about their self-esteem, their dignity, their self-worth. He says a real neighbor extends dignity to all mankind. And I'll tell you what a powerful tool for reaching others that can be. Because many times, folks who are open to the gospel of Christ are folks who have had all their dignity stripped away. And maybe it's been stripped away because others have mistreated them. Maybe their dignity has been stripped away because, you know, the circumstances of this world have been hard. But much of the time, folks have lost their dignity because they've given it up. They have. You know, if we could just learn one basic principle in our society, it would improve our society a hundredfold. And that is for people to say, most of my problems are my fault. Isn't that right? Folks, that is a universal truth. Most of a person's problems in their life are their own fault. If you follow the manual for life called the book of Proverbs, and you just, you know, disciplined, with disciplined effort, and, and just meticulously 
robotically follow all of those rules, let me tell you, your life's going to go pretty well. Most of those folks who come into this church who we're trying to reach with the gospel are going to have dignity issues because they've made a lot of mistakes. But here's the thing. I've made a lot of mistakes. You've made a lot of mistakes. God's people aren't about folks who have to have others prove their worth to offer them dignity. We didn't have to prove our worth to him for him to give us our dignity. He went the extra mile. He extended dignity even to those who don't feel it because they've given it up. You have been that church. Continue to be. Verse 15 says, you shall not do injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. We live in a world of stereotypes. We live in a world where if you fit a certain mold, you'll be treated a certain way. If you don't fit that mold, you'll be treated less. And over in 1 Timothy Chapter 5, verse 21, Paul will address this as he says to Timothy, I charge you before God, the Lord Jesus, and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. This means, in essence, we don't buy in to the world's labels. We don't buy in to that if a person looks a certain way, they have more value or more worth than someone else. We don't buy into the idea that a person who has lived a certain kind of life, that they're more eligible for faith than others. Here's the thing. Christianity, the only people who are eligible for Christianity are sinners. And that takes all kinds of manifestations. I mean, sin affects people in so many different ways. We don't look at folks and judge them based upon anything except the fact that if they need Jesus or if they've found Jesus. The labels don't just hurt individuals, but they hurt entire communities. Do our prejudices point often to our own fears and weaknesses? I think they do. When we judge other people, it's just a mirror reflecting insecurities, a lack of self-worth. We need to be stronger than that. You have been. Continue to be. And then verse 16, he wraps up this definition of what it means to really be a neighbor with this. You shall not go a, as a talebearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. Gossip, or as he calls it here, talebearing, is so very, very, very ugly. It's so, it's such a sense of, of tearing down the value of another person. And when we look over in Proverbs chapter 20, 19, Solomon tells us, he says, he who goes about as a talebearer reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with one who flatters his own lips. He says, gossip, talebearing, going and saying negative about people. He says, all that does is reflect who you are. And it isn't flattering. So he says, don't, and here's the thing. We need to be careful. If someone likes to gossip about others, I would advise you to run from them. Don't make them your friend. Don't be close to them because if they talk about other people with you when other people aren't there, they will for sure, 100%, without question, no doubt, they will be talking about you when you're not around. So Solomon tells us, just avoid those people. Just avoid them. And for sure, don't be them. You see, it's pretty easy to understand what needs to come from our lips 
Because Jesus says what comes out of your mouth is a reflection of your heart. So before we speak, we need to always think. T-H-I-N-K. Is what I'm going to say true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? And is it kind? Think. True, helpful, inspiring, necessary, and kind. If all of our conversations, all of them, are dictated by those five principles, we're a real neighbor. Isaiah chapter 58 is where we'll turn to conclude our message this morning. Where it says in verse 10, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness and your darkness shall be as noonday. If you extend this goodness, dignity, goodness, uh, uh, impartiality, if you retain your tongue, he says, you will shine. And folks who live as a good neighbor, they shine. I spent more time talking with folks who were looking at our home about who my neighbor was than I did about the kind of floors we have or what we've done to the place or our deck or whatever. All those, those were much less on my heart than the quality neighbor that lived next door. I'm sure over this Christmas season, some of you have watched your favorite Christmas movies. When I was a kid, it was, you know, Miracle on 34th Street and all those old ones. Now there's a whole new crop of Christmas favorites. From you'll shoot your eye out Christmas story to, you know, Elf, which is really kind of ridiculous, but people really love it, to all sorts of newer folks, but newer movies. But I can tell you, my favorite is still the tale of George Bailey in It's a Wonderful Life. And I don't know that media has ever depicted a better image of a real neighbor. You remember, he spent his whole life making sacrifices for other people. The old building and loan, he had to take it over when his, you know, Father passed unexpectedly. He couldn't go and do the things he wanted, travel the world. He had that suitcase ready to go, and he, he never was able to do that. And then he settled down, married, had a family. He didn't want to run the old building alone, but he spent his entire life, his entire career, because other people needed him. He saved their homes in the Great Depression. You remember? Because he made personal sacrifices to do it. And then because of a, an error some lost money from his relative, George Bailey finds himself in an impossible situation. The bank examiners are gonna come, and if that money's not there, even though he could turn in his relative, even in his worst moments, he's not going to not be good to other people. He's gonna take it on himself. And he goes up on a bridge and he thinks about killing himself till he meets Clarence, his guardian angel, kind of a, substandard guardian angel according to the movie but he gets the job done because he shows him what life would be like for everybody around him if George Bailey had never been born and at the end you'll remember that he runs home to his family and he doesn't care about about all this trouble in his life he just cares about the people that he's made an impact on and at the end of that movie it always just ah oh, just wells up emotion in me to see all these friends and family and neighbors and they come in and they start putting money in and more money is given than all, all that he needs and they said to George Bailey the richest man in town he wasn't the richest man in town because he had a great career he wasn't the richest man in town because he had a lot of money he was the richest man in town because he knew what it meant to be a true neighbor. As we move into 2020, keep being a true neighbor. This morning, if you have any need in your life, if we can help you, encourage you, lift you up, 
Or if you just want to make a change, this is your last Sunday before a new one begins. This New Year's resolution stuff, I think it's actually pretty good. Gives you an opportunity or at least a, a, a sense of a new beginning to say, I want to be a better me. I want to be more spiritual. I want to be more focused on the Lord and others. I want to be a better neighbor. If you want to make that commitment today, come right now as we stand and as we sing.